Hey everyone and welcome to our YouTube channel. This video will be a OneTrust tutorial. If your team handles personal data, then you have to know about OneTrust, as OneTrust is one of the most popular platforms to manage new laws, demanding customers, and real risks. Privacy, consent, data requests, vendor risk, incidents, and more. So in this video, I'm going to be walking you through the core modules, how you can set them up, and the strengths and weaknesses that you should keep in mind when using this tool. And if you would like to get started with OneTrust, then go ahead and navigate to the link in the description down below. Book yourself a free demo while you watch along. As for OneTrust is, at a simple level, OneTrust helps you find your data, govern it, prove compliance, and build trust with your customers. It bundles tools for data discovery and mapping as you can find and classify personal data across your systems, helps you manage consent and preferences as you get the cookie banners, consent logs, and preference centers, DSRs or DSARs that handle access, deletion, correction, and portability requests, PIAs and DPIAs as you can assess privacy risks for new projects and changes, and then we have incident and breach management, so you can handle the intake, investigation, and report third-party risk as you can assess the vendors, track contracts, and monitor risk, and finally website scanning as you can detect cookies and trackers and keep your banner honest. It is built mainly for mid-size to large organizations, especially those operating in multiple regions or industries with complex rules. Smaller teams can still use it, but the learning curve and cost may be a little bit too heavy if your needs are simple. Now, the way you can get started with this platform is that you can think of it as a set of tiles on a shared platform. The first tile is the privacy and data governance, with the data mapping, DSARs, PIAs, and incident response, consent and preference management with the web, mobile, and marketing consent, third-party risk with the onboarding, assessments, and continuous monitoring, tech risk and compliance, data use governance, and AI governance. The AI governance mostly handles the inventories, risk reviews, transparency, and lifecycle oversight. All of these things plug into the dashboards, workflows, roles, and reports so you can manage and prove compliance end-to-end. -end. Now, when you end up getting your demo and getting your account, you can sign in and then you will see the navigation onto the left with modules like consent, data mapping, assessment, DSAR, incidents, third party, reports, and admin. The dashboards and the center at a glance will give you metrics like the open DSARs, assessment status, vendor risk, and consent rates. And in the global search at the very top, you will find the systems, vendors, records, assessments, or policies by keyword. So of course, you want to start by opening the module that you need the most right now. After that, the first step would be to stand up data discovery and mapping. So the goal would be to build a living inventory of systems that store personal data. Starting with that, connecting sources as you can start with your CRM and your marketing tools, a data warehouse maybe, and file stores. After that, you scan and classify, as you can use the discovery to find personal data like names, emails, IDs, health data, etc. You create a record of processing activities, so for each system or process, you can capture the purpose, legal basis, data categories, and so on, and then you assign owners and stewards. So every system needs a clear business owner for accountability. And finally, you link to policies as you can tie each record to relevant policies or retention rules. I highly recommend starting with 10 to 15 high impact systems and then expanding every sprint. Next up, you'll launch consent and preferences. The goal here would be to capture valid consent and respect it everywhere. And that starts with website scanning as you can run a scan to detect the cookies and trackers on your sites. After that, you configure your banner by choosing region-specific modes, opt-in, opt-out, or hybrid, set categories, so necessary, analytics, or marketing, and then style it to match your brand. You can also sync to marketing tools by connecting to email platforms and then tagging systems so consent goes with the user. The next step would be to automate the data subject requests or the DSR. So the goal of this step is to handle access, delete, correct, and portability requests on time every single time. And you can start by adding a simple public form like a name, contact, request type, or region, and then do a verification step where you can configure your verification with email link, knowledge-based check, or manual review, and then routing as you can create workflows that send each request to the right teams and systems, use connectors or discovery to pull relevant data back into the case, 
and then it allows you to redact where needed as you can generate a clean package and respond within the legal time frame. A tip I would give you is to set email templates by region and then add auto updates to reduce support tickets. Additionally, you get access to some reporting and dashboards that actually help you, such as the executives ones for the top risks, DSAR volumes, consent rates, vendor tiers, and open incidents, privacy team as you get the PIAs by status, mitigation overdue, policy exceptions, etc. And then marketing for the opt-in rates by region or channel, banner performance, and unsubscribe reasons. I recommend picking 6 to 8 KPIs that drive decisions. As for the strings of why large orgs pick one trust, first of all we've got the breadth. As it is rare to find privacy, consent, DSAR, PIAs, incidents, and vendor risk all under one roof. Scalability as it is built for global programs with many regions, brands, and teams. Workflows and evidence, reporting, and ecosystem. You get lots of integrations, content packs, and a big user community. As for the weaknesses, first of all, we've got complexity as it is powerful, but that also means layered menus, many settings, and a steeper learning curve. The cost for the license plus implementation implementation plus integrations can all add up, especially for smaller teams. UX friction as the UI keeps improving, but some areas will still feel dense and click heavy. And finally, for the customization effort, as you can tailor a lot, but deeper changes will often need admin skill or development time. So in conclusion, you want to choose one trust if you operate multiple regions and process lots of personal data, or if you need one system for consent, DSAR, PIAs, vendor risk, and incidents, or maybe if you have or plan to build a small privacy office with clear owners and stewards. If you would like to get started and book yourself your own OneTrust demo, then go ahead and navigate to the link in the description below this video. Leave a like if you have found it to be helpful or informative to watch, and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos relating to this one.